Okay. Um, oops. Just push got it. Okay. Uh, I did have, um, I had a, um, a couple questions Monday night from Mexico, or no, they were from Brownsville, I believe. And it was the question was um, okay. Um, the questions were, were how do we develop the gifts of the spirit uh the fruits of the spirit how do we how do we get those in our lives that was number one question number two was how did the people who resurrected matthew 57 matthew 27 52 qualify for that resurrection so and that's who i recorded that on and uh I was telling somebody today, I said, I, I'll never remember all of what I said. We had a good Bible study, but I don't, you know, I, it was just kind of shooting from the hip because they asked the question after we started Zoom. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I thought I might say something about it tonight some because um, it just seems like it goes along with what we've been talking about on, on, um, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, especially working on the Beatitudes. We've recently talked quite a bit about meekness. Um, finding out that meekness has to do with uh, yielding really to the servitude of others more than it means just to be calm. It really biblically means that you're 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 really and there's a by the way there's a a poem. Let me see if I can give you all that poem right quick if I can find it. I'm not sure. I'll be about to just a minute. that a sister, it was actually written in a song, a sister in, in our church years ago, before I even came to the body, this was her song. And um, uh, we never could find that song, my wife and I, my wife really liked it. And, and um, so here's this, here, it was a poem uh, by written by the name of a man's name by the name of Charles D. Miggs. And the name of the poem was Others. He wrote it in 1902. And then he finally allowed it to be set to music in 1916. And here's what the poem says It says, Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self forgetful way that even when I kneel to prayer, I mean to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I might live like thee. Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I do for you must needs be done for others. Let self be crucified and slain and buried deep and all in vain. May efforts be to rise again, less to live for others. And when my work on earth is done and my new work in heaven's begun, may I forget the crown I've won while thinking still of others. Oh, that was uh, the, the, the uh, and then they, they put it to music. Um, I haven't, I don't know that I've heard it sung since I was in full gospel church in 105 South Sadie Street in San Antonio, Texas, in 
Texas back in the 70s, early 70s. But anyway, it was a it, it is a good uh, repertoire of 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 meekness because that's really what Bible meekness means. It, it really means to yield your own self. You know, I, we talked about this. Pride is, the word pride in the Bible is referring to selfishness. Brother Leninger taught the body way back in the 90s uh, the first place I heard him talk about it was in at the campground. I remember he said, you know, we can't be proud of nothing. <laughs> he said, because pride is, has to do with self, selfishness, ego. I remember Brother Clyde Patton asked him when he first said that, he was behind the pulpit, and Brother Patton said, we can't be proud of nothing, brother. And he said, no, we can't be proud of anything. And so he told us, he said, when you, you know, when you, from now on, when you start to say proud, change that word to thankfulness. Say, I'm thankful. I'm not proud of my children. I'm thankful for them. Because I, to be proud of them is your, that's lifting up your selfishness or, you know, I'm, I'm thank, I'm proud. I'm lifted up because of my kids. But if we're thankful, we're thankful to God because of, because of, you know, if we've taught them right and they do good, well, then we're thankful that God helped us to develop them properly and teach them in, in goodness and uh, righteous uprightness. Anyway, so ever since then, I've never been able, you, I don't, I don't think any of you could could find me guilty of saying I'm proud of anything. I, I just can't, I can't use that terminology. I just, you know, it did something to me when Brother Leninger caught that and I felt something in it, you know, and I, and now when I'd start to say proud, I just automatically say thankful. And that put something in my heart and in my spirit, that, you know, made me realize that, uh, you know, the true meaning, biblical meaning of, thankfulness or pride I mean I and I've heard different men say that that wouldn't accept that teach what Ron Langer said about it and they'd say well we don't mean that in our definition of pride today or proud being proud we're actually meaning thankfulness but maybe they were but I wouldn't you know I, I, I never had thankfulness in my mind when I said proud I'm proud and uh, so anyway, I, you, you, you can take that for what it's worth, but I think that it's, um, I think Brother Leninger was right on that. And I think it's a, it's a good practice to get pride out of our life. There ain't nothing biblical that makes pride, um, you know, a, a good thing. And so I don't think we are to, we're going to be messing with things that the Bible don't show is good. Anyway, getting back to the fruit of the Spirit, um, you know, in, in Galatians 5 and 22, in fact, I'll, I'll screen share here just a little bit. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can do this. Um, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Of course, um, I will just go ahead and say here that in, in Revelations 22, it shows us that John said, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the 
street of it, and on either side of the river was there was a tree of life. I have showed there that in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life. So I've showed that, you know, out of the, the river of life, there is the tree of life. Christ is the source of the river. He's the tree of life. On either side of it, he sees here a tree of life, which I've showed I've just said that that's a picture of the early church and the restored church. That there's a there there was a tree of life in the early church. They got back in the garden. Now least man put forth his hand eat of the tree of life. Uh, that was what Jesus told said when he put up two cherubims and a flaming sword turning every direction to get back in the garden. Um, you know, I think we we're, we have to, um, I think we have to recognize that the garden uh, the garden condition that Adam had with God was that's just what it was. It was a condition I, I, you know, I know people here at home may get tired of hearing me say it, but I've, I've said many times that I doubt seriously that Adam slept in any different place after he got kicked out of the garden than he did the night before. And that makes a point that he probably didn't leave the environment. Maybe he did, but, but he wouldn't have had to because, I mean, when you look at it, the two cherubims turning in every direction and the flaming sword, I mean, the two cherubims with the flaming sword turning in every direction have to be symbolic. There wasn't a place like that. There's no two cherubims setting up. We know where the Garden of Eden, you know, was, what that location is. And th that, that's symbolic. Those two cherubims represent God and Christ. It represents the old new covenant that they stand for. That's their character is what's projected in those two covenants. And, and the word of God turning in every direction, judging everything. It'll judge everything in your life. You can't, there's no, you can't escape anything from God's judgment not to get back in the garden. And so there wasn't any fence around the garden. So all all Adam would have had to do just walk around the two cherubims and the flaming sword and walk right back where he was. Wasn't anything that would have kept him out of the location that he was in, but what he lost was not a physical home. It was a relationship with God, what he got, what he lost. It's what God took him out of. And now, unless you go back through the covenants, God's covenant with, with man for life and, and go back through that flaming sword and eat of the tree of life and live. That was a stipulation. Um, it's like I've recently said, you can, you can go uh, in the early church Second heaven was available, which I've recently been talking on the fact that the garden, paradise, Eden, second heaven and the holy place are all the same place. That's the same condition in God. And <clears throat> in the early church, that was, it was available. The garden was a place that it was a it was a place in God that was it wasn't permitted to sin in that condition. You had to be in a condition where you could live above sin. Adam lived above sin until he decided consciously to sin against God, knowing the punishment would be death. Uh, Jesus 
Jesus lived on this earth from the time he became accountable until the time he, he died. Jesus lived without sin. He never committed a sin. And he had that place in God that he was in that garden condition. Adam calls him the second Adam in, in was that 1 Corinthians 15, where he's called the second Adam. And um, he had the power to live above sin. Uh, and therefore, it looks like you would have to be in a garden condition or second heaven condition or in the holy place or in Eden, whatever you want to call it. Um, you'd have to be in that place for God to finish his work in you. Uh, you know, the picture is, is the outer court in the tabernacle or the holy place, the sec second heaven, first, second, third heaven. So. Um, second heaven, um, where's that scripture? Well, here, let me, I'll, I'll come back to this, but just let me ramble here just a little bit to get my thoughts out. Uh, in Revelations 11, um, uh, right here in the 18th verse. Of course, this is the right here in the 15th verse, the second, the seventh angel sound. This is the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet is the last prophetical trumpet in the last 15 years. Um, so it's it is in a sec, the second heavens available. That's something I wanted to mention a minute ago that just because second heaven was available in the early church are just because it will be available in the restored church doesn't mean that anybody can have that relationship with God. You have to develop and qualify for that relationship with God. You don't want to go into second heaven if the judgment of second heaven is eternal death. If you sin, you don't want to go in that place until you're qualified and have the power to live above sin. So here the second angel sounds, the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet, um, saying the kingdoms of this world become the kings of our Lord and his Christ, and he'll reign forever and ever. So he's he's once again on the right horse, uh, exist again in a restored church. Four and twenty elders sat before God on their seats, fell on their faces, and worshiped God. That's the ministry. Say, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, who, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. I, right here, uh, I like to use this Psalms 98. Let me go to it right quick. In fact, I'm going to bring it down here because it's easier for y'all to see. I'm using this with the, the nations were angry. See, it starts off up here and says, Oh, Lord, sing, oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and holy arm hath gotten him victory. This, his right hand's his ministry and his holy arm's Christ had gotten him the victory. This is in the early church. The Lord hath made known his salvation, his righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of the Lord. I've explained that. You know, I have a message here about the fact that, you know, they're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, that ain't talking about the whole world. It's talking about all the world that God is dealing with back there in the church and those that he sent Paul to among the Gentiles back there. It included all the Jews and the Gentiles, but he didn't go and they didn't go into all the world and neither will we. 
we'll go where God sends us to go. And then uh, the after the bride's made up, then the bride in Christ will rule through a ministry here on the earth down through the thousand years throughout the whole earth. Finally, the whole earth will will, will be uh, salvaged, what, whoever can be salvaged out of it. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with a harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm, with trumpets, the sound of cornet, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar. There's, I'm, I'm, I'm using this scripture here to show there in Revelations 11, the nations were angry. The sea roared. That's the world. When that early church uh, went forth, uh, when that early church went forth, the, it made the nations angry. I mean, they made Rome mad. Rome was after them. But Rome was over the whole world. So Rome turned the whole world. Them and Judaism turned the whole world against the body of Christ. The sea was roaring. The sea was troubled. Uh, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. So um, that's what he was saying here was that um, and the nations were angry, verse 18. And thy wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name. Here, God, here is a resurrection. This is the resurrection that we're showing that will take place in the restored church. This is in the final trumpet where this takes place. Uh, in, and like I was saying, second heaven's available, but you got to qualify to go into it. Everybody that comes in is going to come in through the gate of faith. They're going to go through a process. They're going to go to the brazen altar, and offer up their sacrifice, give their life back to Christ. They're going to... Uh, they're going to obey the gospel and obey the Lord and work in order and begin to develop and renew their minds and prove what's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, and so here God's going to reward, reward those. It's time, uh, the time of the dead, that they should be judged and you should give reward unto their thy servants, the prophets. And to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, should destroy them which destroy the earth. So God's going to judge the beast system at that time. And the temple of God, here's a scripture I was, went here far, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament. There was lightnings, voices, and thunderings, and earthquake and great hail. So not only was the holy place, the temple open, but even the ark, the holy of holies, there was a way back into, uh, how do he say it? Now at least man put forth his hand to eat of the tree of life and live. That's eternal life. That was opened back up. That's going to be opened back up in the seventh trumpet. Um, there, I know there's men saying, you know, we can make it right now all the way. I'm sorry, I disagree with that. And because of scriptures like this right here, I've been preaching this for a long time. Brother Leninger and I both preached it. And nobody gives us any answer to what we're saying about this. That, you know, here's a seventh, here's a seventh trumpet. The temple was closed before now. How can you make it if you, if, if you don't get in the seventh trumpet. So, you know, there's just too many, there's too many uh, scriptures that we would have to do something about. And I, so far, I haven't got anybody to help me with them. 
if we, if we would be wrong on that, which I certainly don't think we are. Anyway, so um, I think that um, uh, and, and the reason I'm bringing that out is because the fruit of the spirit, you know, in other words, the the for the the, the question that I had Monday night was was how do we develop the fruit of the spirit? Well, you cannot, you can't just make up your mind. It's like somebody recently told me, said, well, I can, I, we can, we can have charity right now. Well, we can have a measure of charity. That's true. We can have a measure of, you know, um, we can have a measure of, of, of faith, we have a measure of uh, humility, meekness. Uh, these fruits, we we can we're developing these fruits as, as we serve God, but He has to develop. He has to do that in us. In other words, um, you know, like for an example, long suffering right here. How um, how how do you how do you develop that? How do you, uh, you know, I mean, if, if the way you're going to develop any of these fruits of the spirit is by serving God and being obedient to God and growing spiritually. I, I made the statement, I believe it was last week when we were talking that, um, uh, you know, somebody asked me the question that somebody says, well, you got the Holy Ghost, so you, you got everything you need to make it. And my answer was, is the Holy Ghost nature, when you're born of it, you're a little baby. And the mind is the vehicle of your very being, whether it's the inner man or the old man, the outer man. The, the flesh are the nature of God, the Holy Ghost, the new man. Paul calling the, the inner man or the new man. That We have two natures once we're born again, but that new nature doesn't have much of a mind because our mind has to be renewed. That would tell you that, the, that Adam had a spiritual mind. God created him with a spiritual knowledge and with power to live above sin. That's, you know, that he, what he didn't have is he did not have experience. He didn't have, he wasn't tempered in all of his knowledge. He had, that's why he had to go through a process, but he had enough wisdom of God and knowledge and understanding to live above sin. Otherwise, God, I don't think God would have put him in a place where he'd been eternally judged by committing one sin. But he had that power. And so for your mind to be renewed, in other words, at some point, man had a, had a new mind that had to start with Adam. But corruption with the fall of Adam brought corruption and sin into the world. And of course, you know, that it took, it took almost a thousand years for the world to become so corrupt. Men, for men to begin to die at a younger age, men lived, Methuselah lived 969 years. All those men back there lived, you know, over 700 years, except for Enoch. He was pleased with God so much. That's that's something that kind of rattled your mind a little bit. That God loved Enoch so much that he took him at 365 years old, and the others got to live to be nearly a thousand years old, 900 and some odd years. Adam lived 930 years. Why? We look at it like the older we live, the more blessed we are. Enoch was more blessed by dying at 365 years old than Methuselah was living to be 969 years old. Think about that. 
you know, God looks at things a little bit different than we do. He was evidently as ripe as he could get in the day that he lived in and God took him. He was not for God took him. God, you know, that's what we say when somebody dies, God took them. And, um, but, but anyway, I'm just saying to, to, um, to qualify, you know, I, I don't think you can just say, well, I'm going to be humble. Well, you're going to have to, God's going to have to help you be humble. How, how do you know how to get a godly humbleness? You know, God's going to have to arrest you with his spirit. What does it say in Ephesians 4 that um, he, um, he led the captives captive? In other words, we were captivated by sin and under the servitude of sinfulness in the nature of Adam. And then Jesus came and captivated us with a new birth, and we were captivated with a new spirit, our nature of God, to do righteousness. And so God, God began to humble us. He, when the Spirit of God got a hold of us, he humbled us. Um, I was going to mention here, I, I started reading it, and then I got maybe a little off track here these two, the tree of life on either side of the river. But right here's the part, which bear 12 manners of fruits. So um, these, these, so Paul mentions, um, he mentions here, um, nine manners. He mentions nine fruits of the Spirit in, in Galatians 5, right here, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. But he doesn't give us the other three, but John sees that there's 12 manner of fruits in this tree of life, that you, you'll bear 12 manners of fruits. So I I have, and this is my rendition, you might say, of the other three. I'm willing for them to be changed, but hope there's here, there, there is now abided faith, hope, and charity, which charity is agape love, love mentioned, love, joy, and peace. Um, but uh, hope is not mentioned, faith is. So I added hope as one of the, as, you know, let's say the tenth fruit of the spirit, um, because uh, what does that scripture say? Um, when it says uh, what we hope for, that's a scripture I'm looking for in my mind. I'm getting it right now. Maybe I'll get it here in just a minute. I'll give it to these others and then we'll find it. Uh, brotherly kindness. This is filial love. Or, uh, you know, in the Spanish Bible, it shows it's uh, fraternal love. It's really friendship love. Um, in fact, I've shown that here lately. I've talked about that. I might have, I, I don't want to, Lord, I tell you, you know, I'm going to get too far out here where I can't finish this up. About Peter, instead of going there, I'll just say something about it again. We could look at it maybe later, but where Jesus, after Jesus died, right before he was crucified, if you remember, he prophesied to Peter that he would deny him three times before the cock crow. And if you... If you want to look at that scripture, and I, I mentioned this last week, but I'm not sure everybody got it. Isn't that the 26th chapter of Matthew where Jesus resurrected? He's, you know, Peter said, I'm going fishing. 
you know, he, he, they, they were totally confused. This savior that they thought was coming to save the world, he gets crucified. And of course he had told them, but I'm not sure they really comprehended all that he was saying to them. And Peter was so frustrated with it all, he decided to go back to fishing. So they went with him. They all went fishing. Here Jesus showed up on the uh, beach, and, and, and you know, we all know the story. He wound up sitting there and they uh, having, I think, that didn't, didn't he eat fish with them there? And, uh, and he asked Peter, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? I think he was probably talking about, do you love me more than these fish? More than going back to fishing? I don't think he meant, do you love me more than these other men? Or that then you love these other 11 men? But when he said that, you know, our Bible translated, Peter answered and said, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. But if you look at those two words, love, when Jesus said, Peter, lovest thou me? That's a agape love. And by the way, that love, it, it really, I mean, it's used as love that even a sinner can have that's never been born again. Uh, it's really talking about the, the center of your affection what your affection is really centered on. It's, it's more than fraternal love or, or filial love, which is friendship love. But that was Peter's answer to him. Peter's true answer to him. He said, Peter, lovest thou me with agape love? Peter said, Lord, you know I'm your friend with filial love. He did not say, I love you like you love me. His answer was, you know, I'm your friend. That's what that second love, if you look at it, the Greek word is Philadelphia. It's, it's filial love or friendship love. Peter answered him, Peter, Jesus answered him again the second time. Peter, lovest thou me with agape love? And Peter said, Lord, you know I'm your friend. So when I saw this, I began to try to rationalize my mind. Why wouldn't Peter answer him back with what he was asking him? Do you love me with agape love? Is that the center of your affection? Do you have that the kind of love for me that I have for you? Of course, you know, he's talking about the kind of love that you lay down your life for your friend. <laughs> and you've got to remember, you got to remember. Peter just had denied the Lord. We, we don't get too much more information out of it, but, but Peter may have been feeling like, where's he going with this? Is he fixing to correct me for denying him? Is he fixing to put, call me on the carpet about that? You know, in other words, if, if I say I love him like he loved me, how could I have denied him? And how can I say that when I did deny him? I'm trying to make a point here that obviously Peter felt the seriousness of denying the Lord and realizing he didn't have the proper love and he couldn't state it. And so the best he could do is say, Lord, you know, I'm your friend. So then the Lord's third time he didn't say, Peter, do you love me with agape love? He said, Peter, are you really my friend? He used filial love that third time. And Peter answered back again, Lord, you know I'm your friend. And he answered back, feed my sheep. So uh, to me, that little story has a lot more meaning to it when you look at those two different kinds of love and what really was transpiring there. Because, you know, I mean, even every one of us probably 
our love for God's probably not where it needs to be. We're going to have to, God's going to have to help develop us in that. Peter had to be further developed in that. And so uh, these, these, these fruits of the Spirit, uh, did I give the third one? The third one is praise. Um, here in Hebrews 13 and 15, it says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Um, joy here is one of the fruits of the Spirit. But joy is different than praise. Uh, let me give you another. I think I've got another scripture here on praise in 1 Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, um, Praise is something God has to develop in you. Um, you know, like a natural little child. When that child begins to grow up under your, in, under your covering and under your home, that child, everything is about it. I'm here for you to feed me. I'm here for you to change my clothes. I'm here for you to tie my shoes. I'm here for you to do everything for me. And that's how it is when you first come to God. You're there to receive. You're not, you're not in any condition to give much. It's sort of amazing. I, uh, when I first came to the body, I came to the body from Babylon. I met this people, and I thought God sent me here to help these people. Because I thought I had something. And that's that's sort of what I run into. You know, like we run into people like these ministers in the Dominican Republic. Brother Green was just telling me about a man, new man he's been working with. And this man has given Brother Green three books. And he said, I'm going to help you build your church. Because <laughs> he thinks he can help Brother Green. But he, he, I told Brother Green, throw them books in the, in the trash. They're not going to help you. you. You can't, if God don't, if God don't make you hungry for what this body's got, you, you're not going to be able to, you know, in other words, there's very few people has a, now I'm not saying they don't have anything they can help you with, but I'm talking about, I mean, I thought that this body needed a lot of help when I first got here. And I thought I was going to help them. That's how exalted I was. Of course, it didn't take them too long to take away everything that I had away from me. And I didn't have nothing to help anybody with. Once they got through, you know, they got me in the boat, but after they got through scaling me, <laughs> I didn't have, you know, I wasn't nothing left. Well, it's just sort of how you are. You, 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 God's got to humble you down and then he's got to begin to work in your life. Um, that's, that's the way goodness here is, um, let me read you three scriptures on goodness. It says, I, and I myself, um, also I'm persuaded of you. I might need to make that, I need to make that bigger for y'all. My brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Okay, then the next scripture on goodness, there's only three of them, so we can do this. Ephesians 5 and 9, he says, For the fruit of the Spirit is all in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. You know, I've heard men mention that. Um, in Romans 12 there, when it says, be ye not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
that there is no such thing as God's good will, acceptable will, perfect will, that it's God's will, his will is only perfect. I've heard men preach that. As a matter of fact, I had heard one man preach on it that almost had me convinced in it. But I can't help but look at it this way, that, that when you come to God and you're doing all you know to do, even it's just after you just got saved, and you're doing all that you, you're capable of doing, that that that's God. That's good, good with God. God God counts you worthy. You're not perfect, but it's good. I think God looks at that and says that's good. I'm my will. I don't have a will above where you're at right now. You can't get above where you are. You're in a good place, but you'll have to develop from there. But then Jesus, if you remember in 61st chapter of Isaiah, he called the acceptable day of the Lord. He called it the acceptable day of the Lord there after the day of Pentecost. Well, people weren't all, there were very few or if maybe none, perfect. But if they were living in a higher place than just being good where God really had them dedicated in a far greater dedication. And they were actually, uh, even if you got in the, in the garden and you weren't perfected yet, you, that would be acceptable with God. I think you can get in a place that's greater than good and it's, it's acceptable. God can accept the fact that you're living in a higher realm of righteousness and all goodness in all goodness and righteousness and truth proving what is acceptable to the lord but we have to continue until we prove what is the perfect will of god um well, here's second thessalonians 1 and 11 says uh wherefore also we pray all always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. All the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That, that's a great place to work, walk, walk in God in goodness. That's called goodness, God, the fruit of goodness. So um, of course, we, we worked on meekness uh, and temperance, but uh, did I finish? Yes, I did finish praise that it, you know, that's a fruit. The fruit of our lips is, is once, let's talk about how a child is always on the receiving end. But once you become an adult, you get on the giving end. You get on the adult in of where you're serving the, the children, the younger. And your life is to be an example and to lead and to help others develop and grow. And um, so, <clears throat> and, and then if you're doing this in God, it develops a praise where you do have a thankfulness to God for everything that you've received because you realize how you got it. You realize you didn't develop it. You're, you can't be proud of yourself. You can only be thankful for what God's done and developed in your life. And that is a fruit of praise that comes out of your lips. It shows your heart of your your affection, it goes back to, to the love of God, the, the very affection that you have for God. I hope that I can love Jesus with an agape love. I hope that I can get beyond the filial love, just where I have a fraternal or friendship type of acquaintance with God. Um, 
you know, it's just in this life we live in, when you read the Bible, you know, my wife and I are, we, I, I hope everyone is reading your Bible through again. We're in January and, and my wife and I are, um, we start reading it. We, we finished it way back in September last year. Um, but I didn't, we didn't want to start it too early because we always try to, we read, we read it uh, every morning and we read two days readings at a time. We're set up to read it in six months, but we never are going to probably finish it in six months because there's times when we're gone out of town. We don't read, we don't read on, norm, on Sundays normally. Sometimes we, we we'll read, you know, sometimes we may read in the mornings two days, and then we may read again in the afternoon. You know, we want to, especially if we're interested in where we're at and we quit where we wanted to go, we want to find out what happened. Of course, we know what happened because we've read it before, but still it's, it gets interesting. We're reading in the chronological uh, plan, the reading plan. I, I read my Bible in a chronological uh, reading plan because it puts it in order of how it was written. You know, the, Moses wrote some of the Psalms. So when you're reading in the, in the writings of Moses Pentateuch, the five first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, where he wrote a Psalms, it'll, it'll be right there where he wrote it in the time that he wrote it. Uh, at least most of the time they'll get it right. Sometimes they may not know the exact, they just have to do the best they do. But it, it puts it in perspective for you. It's just like the prophets. When you're reading about the kings and there's a prophet that was prophesying to that king, you know, like you, you could read one of the five your prophets or one of the 12 minor prophets and never know where really you fit that and unless you really studied of what king he was talking to you went back and read the kings and and tried to get that in your mind but if it if it prophesied if it's prophesied while you're reading about that king in the book of kings or chronicles it it helps you get it fitted in order as the bible was written the Bible was uh, put together categorically, you know, the five books of Moses, the, the 12 books of history, the five books of poetry, the five major prophets, and the 12 minor prophets. Same way in the New Testament, and the four gospels of Jesus' life before he came back on the day of Pentecost the historical book of Acts, and then the 13 or 14 epistles of, of Paul, and then James, two epistles of Peter, the three epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. So it's put together categorically so you can look it up. You can look at an index and go to that book, which you'd never be able to find some of the Psalms or some of the prophets It'd be real hard to find it if they were all, if you're trying to read a chronological Bible. So is they put it together categorically so it's easier to find things. But when you're reading your Bible, my recommendation is read it in chronological order, and uh, you'll be able to you know, eventually you'll get it in your mind better of, of how it was laid out. Anyway, I just want to, I'm saying all that to just admonish all of you to read your Bible. It's very important to read your Bible through. What I was going to say was, is that when you're reading about the children of Israel, when they come out of Egypt, and you read about that and you think, you know, number one, this was an, um, it's a, it's, it's an amazing thing to imagine three million people out in the desert encamped around a tabernacle. 
you know, here set this tabernacle. And God put, he encamped Israel around it. He first put Aaron and, and Moses and Aaron at the eastern side of the, you know, you had to get in through the eastern gate that they, Moses and Aaron, the, the Levitical tribes surrounded the tabernacle before the encampments of the tribes. So Moses and Aaron was at, on the east side of the tabernacle. On the south side was Kor, Kohath. These were all Levit these were the Levitical priesthood. Uh, Levi was uh, Levi. This tribe of Levi it was broke up into these four tribes. Kohath was on the south side. Then Gershon was on the west side, and Merari was on the north side. And then out on the east side, outside of Aaron and Moses, was Judah. Judah, the 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 tribe of Judah and Issachar and Zebulun was, Judah was in charge of those three tribes in that eastern encampment. And then south was Reuben, the firstborn. He, his tribe was in charge of the south encampment, which was where uh, the tribe of Simeon and Gad were. And then on the west side was Ephraim. Now Ephraim was in charge of that encampment. He was, see, he was just outside of, uh, who was that? Gershon, the Levitical tribe. See, these encampments protected those Levites that were around the tabernacle. And so Manasseh was the leading in charge, tribe in charge, and in that encampment with him, with, with Rube, I mean, Ephraim was Manasseh and Benjamin. And then on the north side was Dan, just north of the uh, Merariites of the tribe of Levi, and so Asher and, and uh, Nephtali was in that encampment with them. Well, um, See, Ephraim and Manasseh were both sons of Joseph, which was one of the 12 sons. So that made up another tribe, the tribe of Manasseh, which made 12 tribes because God didn't count the Levitical tribe. He didn't count them in, in the main encampments because he saved them for himself. He took them instead of the firstborn of all of Egypt. He took the tribe of Levi for himself. Anyway, uh, what I was going to say is, I mean, can you imagine three million people? Have you ever even stopped and thought about it? If you was in the tribe of Manasseh or Ephraim, how far would that be where there's three million people encamped to the east side where Judah was. I mean, I know they weren't in camp spread out as much as Little Rock, Arkansas, which is less than three quarters of a million people in population, but three million of them probably was something like Little Rock. How long would it take you to ride a camel from where you're at to my house? <laughs> what, 20 miles? I can tell you, I rode a horse one time when I was 12 years old, 30 miles, and it took me all day into the night to get 30 miles on a horse. I will admit I stopped at a lake and went swimming on the way, but I wasn't there an hour, got back on my horse and took off again. Me and another guy, 12, can you believe that? 12 years old, I took off and rode a horse 30 miles from uh, McAllister, Oklahoma to Wilberton, Oklahoma. And I'll have to admit, before I got to Wilberton, I, it was dark and I stopped and called my uncle and he come in his pickup with his cattle rack and we loaded that horse and I, he he drove me about the last seven or eight miles <laughs> and, and he come and got me. 
But I'm, what I'm just saying is, is imagine how big this was, this encampment of God. And my point about it was, is all of these people lived under the law of Moses and God was dealing with them. I mean, compare that to the life that we have today. I mean, how, how closely connected are we connected to that kind of operation of God? How far has corruption got into this world? My point, one of my points. Well, I just have to say, I know God knew it'd get like this, you know, and uh, the Lord still has the power to save us in all of it. But I mean, sometimes when you read that, you think, God, we need to be in a place like this where we're not worried about making all this money and living in these big homes and all everything that we do when the bottom line of it is serving God and doing the will of God and having God help help us and lead us and guide us into all righteousness, all this goodness of God. Anyway, my bottom line to how do we develop the, the fruit of the Spirit is the only way we can do it is to serve God and dedicate our lives to Him and live for Him the best that we can. We can't add one stature to ourselves. Only God can do that. But we can do, I mean, the, we can do what God asks us to do in being faithful and diligent to serve him, and he will develop these things. He will open our understanding, our knowledge. The Spirit of God will do that for us as we serve him. That's what I'm saying about the holy place. We can't just make up our mind we're going to run into the whole. What is that scripture in, in Hebrews that says, uh, with all boldness, we uh, enter into the holy place. Is that what it says? Uh, here, let me look at it right here for you, and I'll get. A, I'll quit here in a minute. By the way, this has no, this this talk ain't got no, they ain't hardly none of it. What I talked on the other night that I'd like to get the recording back up. In the ninth chapter of Hebrews here, I want to get that scripture concerning bold, with boldness. Here it is. Having therefore, brethren, it's in the 19th verse in chapter 10. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Well, number one, he's saying, uh, let me back up here to 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. What that means is, is that he's perfected the way by his offering to set us apart through a new birth. It doesn't mean that he perfected us when he was on the, we weren't made perfect then, but he perfected the means. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us that after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. He's quoting from Jeremiah 31, 31. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Notice what he said there. And their sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. Now where remission of sin is, there's no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in the holy place, holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say the flesh. Well, here, this word boldness, it's interpreted um, confidence. Uh, I don't like using a word, the word boldness, to enter into the holiest, which really, here, let me show you. 
Hebrews 4, boldness is defined confidence right there in Hebrews 4. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That word bold. Uh, trying to get to it. No, it didn't come up. Not sure I'm clicking on the right word here just a minute. Here we go. This may not be the right scripture. Just a second. Just a second. Right here it is, it's in Hebrews 10, 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence. That's the same word, Greek word, use confidence there. I like that word better because I don't think we have, I don't think we ought to have, I think it's just a better word that we are, we, we've got confidence that we can enter into the holy place, not, not the whole, this is, this, the, the word here, let me show you. This word is translated holy place, holiest and holy place both. It's translated sanctuary, holy place, holiest of all in holiness. Well, I don't think that the King James interpreters understood at that time how to use holiest and holy place as two different places like we understand it's talking about second and third heaven. This should be holy place here. Uh, but, but we are to have confidence to enter in. Once God's developed us, we've got confidence. But, you know, to me, the way I'm looking at boldness is like, uh, you know, entering a place where the angels fear to tread. <laughs> you know, that kind of boldness that, that we don't want to we don't want to be bold just barge in uh, before God, but we want to enter in with fear and um, and and very you know that the Lord would grant us that we come to a place that we've got confidence to move forward in God and what He's asked us to do. Uh, anyway, so uh, and I think that I'm thinking that what I'm saying about um, that God has to develop us in each, in our walk. How does it say, if we be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. So for God, if for you to be led, God's got to be leading. You, you, you can't just take the spirit of God and move forward without knowing that you're, you're, being led of God and you're you're yielding to his will as he leads you. So anyway, um I don't know if there's any questions. Is there any questions before we stop? Let me quit sharing here. Y'all are such good students, you know, that I'm, I, there's no questions. I, I made it so plain that there ain't a question about it. <laughs> uh, well, I understand. I'm just going on. I know that uh, sometimes there's two reasons people don't ask questions. Number one, uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's no such thing as that. 
stupid means you can't learn nothing. There, so the question is, is, is uh, I, I need more information because I don't have enough information. I don't have, you know, I, I can learn. I'm not stupid. I can learn. I just need an answer to my question. So it's no stupid question. They're all questions are good. That's one reason people don't answer questions because they don't want to voice the question. Another reason they don't ask questions is, is because they don't want the preacher to talk another 30 minutes. <laughs> they know if they ask a question, it's going into another deal, you know, so it's going to take more time. So I understand, I understand both reasonings behind that. Anyway, um, okay, well, before we uh, go tonight, let's pray. Uh, Brother Painter asked that we pay, pray for um, uh, Brother Willie Denman, uh, his father-in-law. He's, he's got pneumonia and needs our prayers. Brother D.L. Jones is in the hospital. They're asking an urgent prayer for him. He's got COVID and he is in the hospital. And of course, most of you know, he's, he's got many health issues. So one of them is, is his kidneys. He has to, he's on dialysis. So this is not good. I mean, we need to really pray for Brother D.L. Jones and his churches and his work. Um, Of course, we're still praying for Brother Fisher's little baby, Brother Sister Fisher's baby, Mallory, Brother um, Lewis's grandson, who's got cancer. Uh, he's a pastor of Norfolk, Virginia, Virginia Assembly. Um, Brother Bill Daniels really needs our prayers. Brother Goss is certainly still needing our prayers and the Guess Keswick Church. What else? Uh, what other brother, brother Ray Weaver and his wife, Sister Susan, certainly needs our prayers. Uh, brother McGowan's daughter, who is living with them right now, I believe, is she's got, she tested today positive, yesterday positive with COVID. And of course, she's been right there with them. So they're certainly exposed. Her mother's got it. Uh, which she she received it from her mom, I think. So we need to pray for the McGowans because they're certainly uh, very well could come down with it. They're, it's right there in their home. So remember that. Um, Brother Matthew Durham's got COVID. Isn't that right? Didn't he touch positive, Brother Durham? Can you hear me, Brother Durham? Yeah, Okay. Yeah, I see you're shaking your head. Yeah, Brother Matthew's got COVID. And the Durham's have been around him. They're exposed, and, but they're not sick. And they were exposed last Sunday. So very possibly they, they, they escaped it, you know. So, but keep praying for Brother Matthew. Uh, I think he's doing okay. He's, he's sick like he's got a bad cold, you know, but he's doing all right. But... Uh, you know, we, we certainly do want to pray for him. So we are having, uh, make this announcement again, we're having a workday Saturday. But there won't be, some people won't be there because of, they're either uh, been exposed to COVID and they're isolated or, or, you know, or they got it and they can't come. So we'll probably work about a half a day. Um, We've got the tile, it's all laid. We, we do need to caulk, there's a special caulk that where this tile goes together, there's a few places that has some little cracks in it we're wanting to fill with caulk. It's, you know, it's, it, you just understand it when we get you there. Uh, we're painting the dining room. Uh, Brother Scott York's been painting there since Tuesday and uh, he's got, the eastern wall, southern wall, and the northern wall painted. And the dining room's got the freezer room painted. 
uh, we don't have the western wall painted uh, or the little hallways. Uh, the washroom's not painted, neither the the pantry. But and we need to get the refrigerators, freezers back in the freezer room. The refrigerators moved, and then all the tables and chairs need to be set up. But we can't do that until we finish with the floor. I mean, all it needs is just some the caulking done, and we'll probably work on the ba the base baseboard, putting it back up around. So I'm not sure we can get it all done Saturday, but with what, but whoever can come, please come, and we'll do what we can do. There is a minister's meeting starting at 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm probably just going to bring my iPad. And, and uh, if y'all won't tell anybody, well, I'll, I'll get on the minister's meeting and I'll take my video off from time to time and go do whatever I need to do and then go back and get back on the meeting. Uh, I can carry it around with me and see what's going if I have to, you know. So anyway, I plan to be at the at the at the work day. But we definitely we we definitely will have to have a work day if we're gonna have the dining room back at use by Sunday. Um so the young men, the strong bucks, you know, we need them there and and uh, hopefully we'll get most of it done. I think we can get enough done to get it back in functioning order. We still may need some painting, but we can leave that that, you know, where we get the tables and chairs back down and we'll have everything around them painted. And then we'll have some other areas, you know, like the washroom, the pantry, that, that can be painted uh, later. It doesn't have to be finished Saturday. We'll just see where we're at. Anyway, I've mentioned these prayer requests. Any others? Brother Keith? Brother Keith, did you get tested? Do you have COVID? Yes, sir, I got COVID. Okay, so we need to pray for Brother Dodson too. He's been sick last few days. So are you doing okay? I'm doing better, but still I'm not out of the woods. Okay, well, we sure keep praying for you. I'm glad you're <clears throat> as well as you are. Um, okay, everybody, let's unmute our microphones and and pray together before we go home, before we close tonight. Precious Lord, oh God. Praise God. Jesus, we love you. Lord. Thankful for your great grace. God, your mercy. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. 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 Oh, Yes. Oh, Jesus. 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 Oh, J
Praise God. God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise God. Thank you, God. We can do nothing in our own strength. Oh, God. Help me to love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise Hallelujah. God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.